Okay, well, it is noon, so I am going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for those that have joined me this afternoon. I hope your Tuesday is going well. My name is Amy Combs, and I'm the Executive Director here at ECAC, and I will be doing today's Tool Time Tuesday segment, uh, Navigating the IEP Process, Essential Steps for Those Families that Are Applying for ESA+, Plus, otherwise known as the Education student um, education savings account um, offered by the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority. A uh, couple quick disclaimers. Um, you'll see right here on the opening slide, ECAC is not a legal services agency. Uh, we cannot and do not provide legal representation or advice and information contained in this presentation should not be used or considered as such. Now, even though we don't do those things, we are pretty uh, pretty savvy on all things related to um, special education laws under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So we know a thing or two. We're just not authorized to practice law. Um, so today we are going to be talking about uh, eligibility for an IEP uh, for those families that are interested in applying for ESA+. Plus. I know that a lot of folks in our state have a lot of feelings about our um, K-12 funding out there. Just another disclaimer that has nothing to do with us. Uh, we are tasked with helping families navigate the special education process. And so what happens at ECAC is we get hammered, hammered with requests um, from families trying to find their way and figure out what, what they need to do, who they need to contact, what they can expect. Um, so that is our role in this. We do not rank or recommend schools. Um, we do not tell families, hey, you should withdraw your kiddo and go here. You should do this, you should do that. Those are not things that we do, but we do help families navigate those systems and those processes. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to do this right here at the end of October is because typically those applications for ESA plus um, open up on February 1st. And because the IEP process can take up to 90 days, I was like, I wanna have this done before November 1st so that families are not scrambling um, you know, 24 hours before the February 1st application saying, how do I, how do I get this? Uh, because there is no fast pass to uh, obtaining an IEP. Uh, the schools have 90 days to complete the whole process. So that is part of why I was like, let me do this now. So folks have the information that they need in a timely manner. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, I imagine that most of the folks that are here are already uh, familiar with ESA+, Plus, but I just took this program overview directly from their website. It is a funding pocket of money that is available through the state, but it is exclusively for uh, school-age children that have been found eligible for an individualized education program through a North Carolina public school. Um, so that is kind of your ticket to even be able to be eligible to apply. And they currently, um, or, or this past year, had funds available, um, could be $9,000, or certain students with certain disabilities may be eligible to receive $17,000 a year. And so this, this is all available on their website. Um, last year and the year previously, those applications typically open up on February 1st. They usually have a priority deadline of March 1st. Um, but that doesn't mean if, if you miss that deadline that you're not still in the running. Um, basically, it is all subject to the availability of funds. And sometimes what will happen <laughs> is families will be notified that they're eligible, but then they decline it. And sometimes that will open up spots as well. So I'm gonna talk about something called child fine. This is a provision under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That is our federal special education law. Um, and basically it is a requirement that all state education agencies have uh, an obligation. They, they have to have policies and procedures in place 
that ensure that all children with disabilities um, ages three to 21 residing in the LEA, and we're going to be using that term a lot, that is the local education agency, or think about the public school unit or the local school district. Um, and, and this would be all children residing in there, and that would include those that are homeless, that would include those with any type of disability, uh, could be very mild, could be very severe, but they are tasked with identifying, locating, and evaluating students that are in need of special education and related services. And so they have a variety of activities that they are tasked with doing to help find those kiddos, but uh, they're not tasked with going door to door and saying, hey, do you have a kid that might be in need of special education? Um, typically, this is uh, the activities would be putting out information. Sometimes you might see it in the front office of a school building that it talks about child fine. It could be working with uh, early intervention providers, could be working with private schools to say, hey, please let us know if you have a kiddo that you think might be in need of these services. Okay, that talks a little bit about child fine. Okay, I mentioned that we were going to be talking about LEA. Um, local education agency, because sometimes when families reach out to us and say, you know, I want to uh, request an IEP, but I don't really know how because my kid's homeschooled or my kid might be enrolled in a private school. I don't know who to do the ask to. And so this is where it can get a little bit wonky. Um, if you homeschool your child, it's pretty cut and dry. Your local education uh, agency is going to be the traditional public school that your child is zoned for. And so, um, you know, if you're living in uh, Iredell County, where I'm at, and Shepherd Elementary is where your kiddo would go, um, if you had enrolled them in the local public school, that would be considered your local education agency. So you could either make the ask directly to that school or you could go to the district's exceptional children's department. Where, where it gets wonky is for those families that maybe have a child that's already enrolled in a private school because um, the language can get confusing. Um, but I, so I just took this direct quote directly from the U.S. the folks at the U.S. Department of Ed. Um, they are stating that when it comes to child find, um, the local education agency where the private school is located is the one responsible for locating, identifying, and evaluating all children with disabilities who are enrolled by their parents in a private, including religious, elementary schools as defined in all that legal, legal mumbo jumbo there. And so I have seen this come up where um, folks have had an issue where perhaps the kiddo lives in Alamance County, but is going to a private school in Guilford County, and they made the request to Alamance, and Alamance said, no, no, it's Guilford's responsibility, and Guilford said, no, it's Alamance's responsibility, and kind of ping-ponged back and forth. Uh, I'm going to send out a document in my follow-up email today from today's presentation that's kind of a whole Q&A, and even reading that, I was getting confused, but if you are getting stuck where you have made the request and they're saying, kind of passing the buck and saying, no, it's not me. I would suggest um, emailing both entities and saying, it's my understanding that child fine applies. I need to know which one of you is going to um, be accepting my referral. Um, and then certainly if you're still getting stuck, we have, we have other uh, strategies and things that we can do or people that we can bring into the loop to help move that process forward. So I mentioned the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act uh, in North Carolina. We also have the North Carolina policies governing services for children with disabilities. That is our local state policies regarding special education. They are aligned with that federal special education law. And so when thinking about a referral, um, they, there's a couple different ways that one can be made. Sometimes it, it would be the school that would make the referral and say, hey, we have some concerns about your kiddo. We'd like to invite you to a, a referral meeting. Other, or the referral could come directly from the parent. Um, and so it, it will say here, when a parent suspects that a child may be a child with a disability, they shall provide in writing the reason for the referral addressing the specific presenting concerns and the child's current strengths and needs. And this referral shall be given to the principal 
of the um, school or the child's teacher or other school professional or the superintendent or other appointed official of the LEA. We recommend when a, a family is going to make an initial referral, first, please always do it in writing. Um, email is pretty awesome because then you've got, you know, a timestamp. Um, nobody can say that you didn't send it. Whereas if you mailed it, somebody could say we never received it. Um, we typically would encourage those folks to reach out to the principal at that school where the child would have been, would have attended if they were going to the public school or reaching out to somebody at the Exceptional Children's Department at the central office of that school district. Um, I know it says superintendent here, um, but they're just going to pass it on to one of those people anyway. So I would just go directly to a principal or somebody at the Exceptional Children's um, Department. When making a request, another thing that is important to uh, point out is that it should be in writing, but if you've made a verbal request to somebody uh, at the school level, they should also be telling you, you need to make that in writing. Um, and if you need help doing so, I can assist you with that. So what would I say? So this is just a real basic way that you could initiate the IEP process with a local public school. Um, so that I just uh, threw this together. Dear, you could put the principal's name, or if you're going to the central office, you could put the administrator's name to saying, I'm writing regarding my son, Joey Combs, who is homeschooled. I have concerns about Joey's educational performance and am requesting that he be evaluated for special education services. I've shared a little bit more information. Joey is eight. He has a diagnosis of ADHD, and he's struggling with reading, organization, and completion of tasks. Thank you for your prompt attention to my request. You can certainly say more. You could say less. What you really want to make sure that you are saying is that I am requesting that my child be evaluated for special education services. One um, theme that we have seen come up uh, a few times in the past couple years is where families have done this and then they're reaching out to us and saying, well, they're telling me that I have to enroll my child in the public school in order for him to be him or her to be evaluated. Um, that is not true. And that was it's pretty evident in child fine. It does not say um, you only locate identify and evaluate those kids that are enrolled in your program. It says you got to locate, evaluate, and identify those kids that are residing where that local ed education agency is. Um, have seen this happen a few times, but usually we'll just give folks the exact language that they need to use and, and get that fixed. There is no requirement that your child would need to be enrolled in a public school um, in order to be evaluated for special education services. Now you can uh, feel free to share more information when you make your referral, um, or if they already are in a private school, you know, he attends so-and-so, he's in such and such grade, you know, here's where the areas that he or she might be struggling with. Um, or you might say, you know, he also receives outside speech, outside occupational therapy, that information can be helpful. Um, and so again, you can share as little or as much as you want, but you wanna make sure that you're making it clear that you are making a request for your child to be evaluated for special education services. Once you make that referral, that is what starts the 90 day timeline. And so they're gonna have 90 days to complete the entire IEP process. And so once you make that referral, you should be receiving an invitation to the IEP meeting. And it looks like this. This is the forms um, that our state uses here in North Carolina. They use a program called ECATS. And so this is just a blank invitation to the IEP meeting. Um, you'll see that we're asking you to attend. They're gonna throw a date, a time, a location. They're gonna list a purpose. In this case, it would be to discuss the special education referral for an initial evaluation. They're gonna let you know um, who is going to be attending the meeting. They're not going to put specific names like Amy Combs. They're going to put the LEA representative. That is often a principal, sometimes an assistant principal, could be uh, maybe even somebody from the central office. It's got to be somebody that's knowledgeable about the district's resources and somebody that is qualified to supervise the folks that provide 
um, special education and general education. They're going to have a, a gen ed teacher or a regular ed education teacher. They're going to have a special education teacher. Um, they will only have an interpreter of instructional implications of evaluation results. Sometimes that's a psychologist, might be a speech pathologist, depending on um, any evaluations that are going to be gone over. They don't always typically come to that initial referral uh, meeting. They often come to ones where the evaluations are going to be gone over. So they can be there, but they don't have to be there unless those things are actually going to be gone over. Um, and then if they're expecting to have anybody else, they will list them on this, um, this form as well. Um, they are supposed to schedule a meeting at a mutually agreed upon time. And so um, if they send you this invitation and it doesn't work for you, we would encourage you to say this actually doesn't work, but maybe list three dates and times that do work. Um, and, and sometimes folks are meeting virtually, they can meet in person, um, but if that day and time that they initially throw out there doesn't work, we would encourage you to work with them because uh, it's really hard to get all the players at the table um, at a time that works for everybody. So um, if you can flex and work with them, that is always, always good. And so you're going to need to respond to this invitation. You're going to need to let them know, yeah, I'm going to be there. Um, or... Uh, I can attend, but I'm going to need this to be virtual or I can attend by phone. Um, I would recommend if you could either be there in person or virtually, I think that is it. it's a better experience than by phone. I've attended IEP meetings by phone and sometimes there's just you're missing things or, you know, there's all different kinds of communication and you're not gauging who's talking or body language and all those things that are important in the process. Um, or you could say, I can't attend, uh, but here's some ideas of days and times that will work for me. Um, I do not wish to attend the meeting. That would be weird if you made the referral and then said, I don't want to attend because they're not going to get past this. They're not going to get past that meeting. Nothing will happen. Uh, because everything that happens after that referral meeting would require your written consent. So um, that would not, I wouldn't make a referral and then say, yeah, and then by the way, I'm not coming. At that meeting, um, once you guys have agreed on a time and place and how to meet, the team is going to go over this special education referral form. And so it always starts off with, let's talk about um, the student strengths. And so this information can come from the parents. It can come if they are in a private school from their current teachers, if they have outside providers, um, or if for some reason the public school is knowledgeable about the student, or if you shared test scores or shared work samples, they can draw on that information. But we're going to see, what do we know about Joey as far as his reading? And they're going to start off with all the strengths. What do we know about math? How about the written language? Um, functional skills. When we're talking about educational performance, it's really important that folks remember that is not just limited to academics. So functional skills are uh, really, really important um, for kiddos. And especially because we have a lot of children that have really high cognition, they may be off the charts in their reading and their math, but it, they may have functional skills that are getting in the way where they can't stay on task, where they can't sit still, where maybe they exhibit um, different behaviors that are impeding their learning or that of others, or maybe they really struggle in the area of daily living skills. Maybe they have trouble with their social skills. And so this is um, an important area that folks don't wanna overlook. And so they're going to say, well, you know, where are the strengths and the functional skills? How about what do we know about their behavior and social skills and then um, communication skills? And then they are going to review any existing data um, from the IEP members. And so certainly for a family that homeschools or private schools, a lot of this existing data is going to be stuff that you bring to the table. And so if you have any results of local or state assessment uh, data, go ahead and bring that. Anything that you bring to the IEP team, they, they must consider it. Now, that doesn't mean they have to follow everything, but they it has to be taken into consideration. And so if you have uh, any past or current grades, um, if the child has been receiving any interventions, um, any of that data or progress monitoring that you might have, 
Um, if you have any outside evaluations, these could be from, again, private therapists, could be from a developmental pediatrician, a psychologist, all of those things. Um, those are going to be relevant data points for the team to consider. And then any information provided by the parent um, in relation to their current academic functional behavior performance at home. Um, and so certainly those at home school, they should have a lot of information about that. You'll be able to say, you know, uh, he does great for the first 15 minutes. He's, he requires lots of breaks after that or, or whatnot. But you want to bring um, as much information as you can that will be relevant to the team deciding how they're going to move forward. If the a school or anybody has any additional observational data that might be relevant, they're going to put that here. Um, if there's any information about uh, the student's medical history that might be relevant, or maybe the child previously received early intervention uh, services, maybe the child is followed by a variety of specialists, maybe there's been a lot of moves um, in the child's life, all that stuff, they want to kind of get a whole a big picture of your kiddo. They're going to inquire about a vision screening, a hearing screening, um, take the summary of any of the screenings and evaluations that have been provided. And then they're going to talk about the reason for the referral or the areas of suspected need. Um, and so they're going to make this based on all of the data that's been providing. And again, that includes the, the parent's input. And so that's what they're going to put in this box. And based on all of that information, they have three ways they can go. One of them is they can say, we're not going to, there's no evaluation that um, needs to be conducted based on all the stuff that we see here and the referral to special education ends. And so this does happen. It can happen. Um, the school can to say, can say, look, we don't see, we don't suspect that this child actually has a disability. Um, and so we are not going to proceed. They are going to have to document in their, their decision as to why they chose not to evaluate. Um, or they can say, we have all the information here that we need. This almost never happens, by the way. <laughs> we have everything that we need, and we have found the child to be eligible. Um, the reason why this almost never happens is because each disability category has very, very specific criteria, um, observations, tests, information gathering, all kinds of things that have to be done data collection that most outside reports are, are good and that they provide a lot of good information, but they don't usually provide all of the required components. And so this rarely happens. It could happen, but most of the time, folks are not going to be found eligible right at that initial uh, special education referral meeting. Or the third option is we would like to move forward and conduct an initial evaluation uh, because we can't determine yet if this kid is eligible by their existing data. They usually have more or other things they have to collect and do. So if you get to this step and they say no evaluation will be conducted, um, you are not going to be able to apply for ESA plus, ESA plus funds. Um, if you get to that point and you disagree with that, there are dispute resolution options that are available um, at the state level that you can explore. We're not going to get into all those today, but that is an, an option for you. Um, otherwise, if you get to this bottom point where they say we're going to go ahead and conduct an initial evaluation, they are going to need your written permission to do those evaluations in order to move the process along. Let me get to my next screen. Okay, and then what they're going to do is say, we do want to evaluate. Once they've got your written permission to evaluate, they're going to determine what categories are we thinking about exploring for this child. And in North Carolina, we have 14 different eligibility categories. Um, you'll see the first one is autism. I can tell you not every kid that has a diagnosis with autism is going to be found eligible for an IEP. Uh, not every child with autism that is found eligible for an IEP 
is going to be found eligible under the autism category. Uh, again, they have very specific criteria. Uh, schools don't get to diagnose autism. They don't get to undiagnose autism. They can determine if they meet the criteria to be served under that category from an educational perspective. Uh, a lot of kiddos that are under eight, sometimes they fall under developmental delay. Once they turn eight, they can no longer be served under that category. Uh, but you can see we have a variety of categories that the team would say, you know, what makes sense? What are we thinking for this kiddo? Sometimes they'll want to evaluate in more than one category. <laughs> the multiple disabilities category, that can be tricky because sometimes folks will tell us like, oh, my kid has multiple disabilities because they might have a diagnosis of ADHD and autism. Um, that is not what this category means in this sense. Uh, for special education, it, that is usually a category that is chosen when it cannot be determined um, what which uh, diagnosis or which condition is having the most impact. And so it's often used for children that are medically complex um, or maybe have significant cognitive disabilities. I did want to mention this category of other health impairment. That is uh, typically where a child um, maybe with ADHD, ADD, maybe even anxiety might be found eligible. That particular category does have a requirement that the student has medical, a documentation from a medical doctor that states this child has a condition that either limits their strength, their vitality, or their alertness. And so if you are uh, making re a referral and those are some of the areas of concern. You want to make sure that you have medical documentation to, to back that up to support um, because they won't be able to find that child eligible with, without something from a doctor kind of saying, yes, this is present. This is what we know about the kiddo. And then they'll kind of determine what all screenings that they're going to want to do. And then they're going to put uh, the names of everybody that participated Folks are asked to sign this. This does not mean that you agree with everything. It's simply your signature is just signifying that you participated uh, in the meeting, in the in the conversation. And then um, you should be given a copy of the parent's rights um, at, well, when you make the initial request uh, referral, you should receive one. And then also it should be made available at this referral meeting. So, and you'll see at the end of this, they put again, um, there's a 90 day calendar timeline. So they have 90 days to go through the whole process, have that initial referral meeting, um, do the evaluation, should, had the, if the team decided to move forward with the evaluations, come back to the table to go over those evaluations and determine eligibility. So when it comes to that initial evaluation, for those um, families that get past that point, point where they say, yes, okay, we are going to do this, the local education agency has to conduct a full and individual initial evaluation. And so each uh, of those 14 disability categories has very specific screenings, assessments, evaluations, data collecting, progress monitoring, all kinds of different things uh, that have to be done in order to do a full evaluation. <laughs> I bolded this uh, point here just as a reminder for folks. Um, when a family makes an oral request for an initial evaluation, um, that the school should provide assistance as needed in completing a written referral. So we really uh, want folks to make those initial requests in, in writing. But if you're here as a school staff and a family says to you, hey, I'd really like to get my kid evaluated, that's your obligation to uh, move forward and let them know, let's put that in writing and I can help you do, do so. And again, I kind of just keep pointing out that 90 days. Uh, just want to remind families about the 90 days because last year, I mean, up until the last day of, of um, February, we had people at the last minute saying, how do I get an IEP by tomorrow? And it's like, well, you don't, there is no fast pass. Um, in this process. And so I could see 90 days equals 90 days. Uh, it's not rock and science. That is what they get. Um, the whole timeline is here. You'll have that initial referral meeting that usually does occur within the first few weeks of getting your written requests. Um, the evaluations 
conducted. That's only if the whole team agrees we're going to move forward and the parents provide that written consent. Um, those things take time because there's a lot of information that needs to be gathered and that that will can take up a bulk of those 90 days. Then they're going to invite folks back to the table again and determine eligibility. Um, and then if if the child is eligible and you are uh, only looking for ESA plus uh, eligibility, you can let the team know, like, we don't have to develop the IEP. This is what I needed. Um, or you can say, well, what would an IEP look like if I were to enroll my kid here? Um, and then they would de de develop the IEP, come up with the goals, figure out the present levels. Where do we need to be? What do we want to work on? And uh, how much time would this child spend with their non-disabled peers if they were enrolled in our school? The thing about eligibility is it all depends. And so the IEP team is kind of tasked with three prongs. Um, first, they got to make sure the student meets the criteria for one of the 14 disabling conditions. They're all listed here. The team has to determine that the disability has an adverse effect on their educational performance. So again, we're talking about academics and that whole functional piece. And they have to determine that the student is in need of specially designed instruction. Sometimes they'll say, yeah, they um, they clearly have autism and they might say, yeah, we see that there's some effect, but we don't think that this needs uh, specially designed instruction. This is something that might just need an accommodation. And so sometimes folks uh, will not be found eligible if all three of these aren't true for the student. This is what the ESA plus folks want. This is the form. They are looking for this eligibility determination sheet. They do not want to see anything else but this. They don't want to see the actual IEP. They just want to see this. And it's it's our state's eligibility determination form. It's going to tell them, yep, the student meets the criteria or no, the student doesn't. This is the, and they're going to, if it's a yes, they're going to check. Uh, the primary disability or the secondary disability, and then they're going to say, yes, there is an adverse effect or no, there isn't. Um, and they're going to say, yes, the student requires specially designed instruction or they don't. And then they will um, answer this eligibility determination and say, yes, the student meets all three of the eligibility criteria. This is your ticket to applying to ESA+. Plus. This is what they want to see. We get a lot of folks reaching out to us because, well, that's another thing I want to say. We have no access to as ESA Plus's class wallet, their database, their portal, nothing. So if people are like, I, I submitted it, but you guys said it was the wrong one. It's like, wasn't us. Uh, but I can tell you, this is the only form they want to see. They don't want to see nothing else. This is, this is your ticket to being able to apply um, and be found eligible. Key takeaways, um, child find applies to all North Carolina public schools and all children with disabilities three to 21. Um, ESA plus applicants, you are not required to enroll your child in a public school in order to be evaluated. Uh, no one data source should ever be used in isolation. So again, the team has to have a variety of sources of information. A diagnosis is not enough to determine eligibility. Uh, there is way many or more, more layers in that. So it's helpful information for the team, but nobody's going to get an IEP just because their kiddo has a diagnosis. Um, the use of interventions cannot be used to deny or delay an evaluation. Some There are some categories that want to know about research-based interventions being used, uh, but that doesn't mean we have to do this first before we can move this process along. They can do those things while the process is occurring. It can be a little trickier for kids that are homeschooled or private schooled um, because typically the public school provides those, uh, but they have ways that they can get the information that they need, or they also have ways to maybe move forward with a decision without that if they're unable to collect that data. Um, absolutely no fast pass to obtaining an IEP. There are those three prongs to eligibility, has to have a, meet the criteria from one of the 14 disabilities, has to have evidence of an adverse effect on their education, and must require specially designed instruction. And lastly, always reminding families that you are the expert on your child. You are their best and most effective advocate. You know your kid the best. You've been in it the longest. Um, and so we always like to champion families as they are advocating for their kiddos. 
And I wanted to see, I think I do have a Q&A while I am pulling that up, getting some stuff out of my way. I should have a poll in here. I'm going to launch. If you've been in a Tool Time Tuesday, um, we usually launch a poll to make sure that the information that we're putting out is useful, relevant, and of high quality. And let's see, can you clarify? Okay, so... What is meant by the use of interventions cannot be used to deny an IEP. So this is often comes up for children that, um, especially those maybe with a specific learning disability, such as dyslexia, where they might reach out to the school and say, hey, I've got some concerns, you know, he's way behind in his reading level, he really struggles. I'd like to have them evaluated for special education. Uh, we have some schools that have told families, well, we can't, we have to do other things first. We have to do, sometimes they call it MTSS or um, RTI, response to intervention, or we have to do these evidence-based or research-based interventions with your kiddo and see how they're responding before we can start the process. And the guidance from the feds is very clear that they absolutely, you cannot cite the use of interventions as a reason to deny, to deny or delay the uh, special education process. And so while there is stuff in some of those uh, categories that says we need this information, that doesn't mean they say, we gotta get it and then we'll start the timeline. The timeline still has started and now they got 90 days to get the information that they need. Uh, one of the things that I'm gonna send out in the follow-up email was our state put out some specific learning disability um, fact sheets. And there is a QA and a one because there was questions on there. Well, wait a second, my kid is homeschooled. How are we gonna get that information? Or my kid's in a private school. Uh, it is, at the end of the day, it is the school's responsibility to collect the information that they need. I have heard of some um, schools asking uh, parents to, that are maybe in the private school or a homeschool to bring their child to the school for some observations. Um, and I get it, that would be helpful. Um, it's not a requirement, but it is them attempting to try and get a, a, a bigger accurate picture of the kiddo, uh, but I will send out that. And so, but anytime any family, whether their child's enrolled in school or uh, the public school or homeschooled or in a private school, if, if somebody says we have to do this first before we can move forward, that is not true. They can uh, get that information while the clock is going, and they should. And let's see here. I think I, may, I think I did that question. Any other questions before we part ways? I lost my poll. I hope it's still up. Oh, it is. Okay, good. Let's see. How does North Carolina define emotional disabilities? I have seen that this would make a kid ineligible for services under autism. So they do have a clear definition of that. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Let me stop sharing my page because I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Of course, it doesn't want to let me minimize my screen while I'm... Uh, Let's see, NCBPI, emotional disabilities. Got to get the forms up. Give me a second. Sometimes uh, it's like a scavenger hunt, trying to find information on other people's websites. <laughs> State forms. Eligibility worksheets. Let me get back to you. I'm going to share my screen. Let's take a look. This is the uh, eligibility worksheet for emotional disability. And you'll see there, these are the required screenings. They got to do hearing vision. You'll see that mentioned. They want to see that there was at least two scientific research-based interventions to address deficiencies in behavior, emotional skills, has to have been a parent conference, communication, yada, yada, yada. 
these are all, they're going to do an educational evaluation, a psychological evaluation, a behavior, emotional evaluation. And they're, here's some of the characteristics that they are looking at to determine if it's an emotional disability, an inability to make educational progress that cannot be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors exhibited over a long period of time and to a marked degree. And so um, if it is due to an intellectual uh, reason, then that kid, rather than emotional disability, might likely be found eligible under an intellectual disability. If, it, if they're saying, hey, this is all sensory, that kid might actually be found eligible under the autism category. Or if it's all health factors, they might say, eh, there's a lot going on here. Maybe it's multiple disabilities. Um, they also want to see that there's an inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers or teachers. And again, over a long period of time and to a marked degree, in, inappropriate types of behaviors or feelings under normal circumstances exhibited. And again, they have that over a long period of time to a marked degree, a general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression exhibited a tendency to develop physical symptoms of or fears associated with personal or school problems exhibited. Um, and so they're going to have to check these boxes here in order to say, yes, this is uh, an emotional disability. And they have, they have a, uh, one of these worksheets for every single category. So that's why I mentioned if you come with an outside report uh, from an outside provider, it's almost never enough because it almost never captures all those things that they need. Uh, what were the three prongs for, again, and can you repeat them? So the child has to have one of the 14 disabling conditions and uh, they have to, there has to be evidence that there's an adverse effect on their educational performance. And again, that's not just, we're not just talking about bad grades. It can be other things. Kids can be really, really smart, straight A students and still be a child with a disability or it can have an adverse effect in another way. I mean, there's kids with dyslexia that are way, way, way smart, but the adverse effect is they've got to put in more time, more effort, more energy um, to get work done. And that creates an adverse uh, effect. Um, and then the third one is it has to require specially designed instruction. And so that when we say that, that that's where folks are agreeing, like this is something that has to come from a special education teacher, somebody or or from a speech pathologist. This is something that has to come from somebody with a specific skill set. They need something different than what the gen ed teacher can provide. Will there be a workshop on progress monitoring? I see in here very little info on dyscalculia in special education. Will that be addressed? Um, I can add that to the list. Um, the progress monitoring is always a challenge um, because that's one thing that we will often ask families, find out about the progress monitoring. Um, and folks don't always get that information or they just get a blurb that says child is making progress. And it's like, that doesn't really tell us anything. And, and when it comes to progress monitoring, um, with these interventions, that is the goal that we would say, okay, wait, this is working. These interventions are working. The child's making progress. Maybe they don't need specially designed instruction or special education, but is it enough progress? Um, I mean, if, if that needle is only moving a little, but we're not really closing the gaps and this kid remains further and further behind, I don't know that that would be enough progress and folks may need to do something different or more intensive, such as creating an IEP. Let me go back to the q and I see I got some. Um, my child is under the other health impairment, already has an IEP and is in the 11th grade. What questions should I ask during the meeting in regards to transition to, to college? And so all of the questions. Um, one thing with your kiddo being uh, heading towards the senior year, it's really, I don't know if he or she goes to their IEP meeting, but I would have them there. They need to be really comfortable hearing about their disability and the impact that it has on them at school. But once they get to college, those folks don't want to talk to mom or dad. They only want to hear from the students. So we want to make sure that he or she's got some good self-advocacy skills. And if not, maybe that's an area where they need to add a goal, where they're comfortable talking about their disability and their needs and what they don't need. Because uh, sometimes, especially as our kids get older, we have a lot of accommodations in place and they kind of don't want them, but mom and dad do. 
Um, and so being being able to advocate for him or herself would be essential. And then asking them, and there's a secondary transition component on that IEP. Um, and it has a variety of uh, areas, post-secondary supports that folks should be talking about and addressing. Um, and then they kind of have a column in who's going to be responsible for that. Some of that's on the parents. Some of that might be on what used to be Voc Rehab, now um, the Division of Employment and Independence for People with Disabilities. Some of it might be on the school staff. Some of it might be on outside providers. Um, but there should be discussions on, you know, he wants to go to college. Uh, what do, what does he need in order to be able to do so? Is he competent at completing college applications? Is that an area where he's going to need support? Is there an essay component? Is that an area where he needs support? Is there, um, is he going to attend college? Is there independent living skills that he hasn't acquired that we need to be addressing? So kind of look at it from a personal lens of what you know about your kiddo, um, what they're really good at, you know, the strengths again, but then the areas of need. Um, and how can the IEP team address those areas? And I think that is it. And I know I went over because that's what I do because I could just talk about these things all day. But I hope um, if you have any additional questions or you're getting stuck in the process, please reach out to ECAC, uh, speak to one of our parent educators. Um, again, if this is something that you are thinking about applying for, make your written request today um, so that you're not you're trying to beat that February 1st um, prime opening of the application and scrambling uh, because folks, this, this truly can take 90 days in some districts. It can take longer because of the uh, staff shortages. And I imagine our um, community in Western North Carolina, uh, the 90 day timeline is gonna be a real challenge for them. So give those folks some grace. Thanks for hanging out and joining me today. Uh, feel free to reach out at any time and I'll send out some good follow-up um, documentation for today's attendees. I'll include the slide deck as well. So take care and thanks for joining me.